Hi everyone, it's Sandy Cruz from Sandy K Nutrition, health and lifestyle queen. And I'm here to show you that balanced living works. This is especially for all you ladies over 40. We will cover a range of exciting topics with many special guests and I really look forward to this season. Bye for now. Hi everyone, welcome to Sandy K Nutrition, Health and Lifestyle Queen. Today I have a special guest with me. His name is Daniel Debon, and he is an internationally recognized expert in EMF radiation. And for those of you who follow me on any social media account, you know I talk about EMF all the time. He is an expert in EMF shielding, EMF related health issues, and a special focus on the effect of exposure from mobile devices, which we're all on all the time, like laptops, tablets, cell phones. Daniel Debon's concern regarding the health and impact of EMF emissions grew from over 30 years of engineering experience, specifically in the telecommunication industry where he held a variety of executive positions at SAIC, Telecordia, AT&T, and Bell Labs. He is also the co-founder and CEO of Defender Shield. This is a company I talked about actually last week. And it is a tr he's also a trusted worldwide expert in EMF radiation education and protection. I mean, I could go on. He's also written a book. It's called Radiation Nation. The Fallout of Modern Technology. And so finally, I will welcome you, Dan. Welcome to my show. Sandy, thanks so much for reminding me. Boy, my goodness me, it sounds like, a, like a, <laughs> I've been working for 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I have to say I am really honored to have you today because oh, thank you. I, I just, I, I want I talk about this, it's been years that I've been talking about EMF, and it's just really nice to have you here to give us the facts. So, you know, maybe I can start with asking you, what exactly is EMF radiation and where does it come from? Um, so, nature um, has electromagnetic radiation. It's the sun we look at. It's the, the, the colors we see. That's known as visible radiation. Mm -hmm. um, we have x-rays, uh, gamma rays, uh, atomic bombs. Those are electromagnet forms of electromagnetic radiation. Right. And, and those are called uh, ionized radiation. And I don't want to describe all the details for that. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that is non-ionized radiation. And that's what uh, is used in radio transmissions. When you're listening to an FM station, you're listening over uh, an RF a radio frequency signal. Um, and that's what the transport is, getting the music to your uh, to your uh, whatever device you're using. Right. Um, your, your household wiring is emitting electromagnetic radiation, very low form of electromagnetic radiation, but it still does. And then um, there's the cell phone, the tablets, the laptops, all of these devices we have around us every day um, that's emitting another form of, a, uh, of that radi radio frequency emissions. So it's all around us, and it's been around for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about that is it's really only the last 15 years or so that we have it in our pocket. B before, none of these transmitting sources were close enough that we would ever consider it uh, a, an issue for the human body. But today, when we have it in our pockets, it does maybe change in which the way in which our body reacts okay. to those emissions. So it's all around. It's everywhere we go today, and in some cases, it's right in our back pocket. Right, right, because I, I have researched that, you know, we will even get EMF from a thunderstorm. Like, I mean, that's electricity, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. 
exactly. Right. It, it, and that's interesting. When you talk about electricity, when if you go on a rug and you and you have wool socks on you and you run along the bottom of that uh, on the rug and then you touch a doorknob, you get a shock. Yes. Th- that's electricity moving. And you never saw that, right? But it's yet, it's still there. Of course, of course. So when, okay, so our bodies... Technically, we know how to deal with a little bit of EMF. We're used to it. We've dealt with it for centuries and centuries, even from nature. So when does it get, I guess, dangerous for the body? So, so let's talk about just what you said. It, 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 the Earth itself generates an emission. Right. Uh, electromagnetic radiation. It's a DC, direct current electromagnetic radiation up to about 12 to 15 hertz right extremely 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 low uh, frequency rate very very low uh, frequency rate um the stuff that we're going to talk about mostly today it has not been around for that many years it's probably only the last hundred or so years mm-hmm. um uh, and 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 the body has been slowly adopting, takes centuries, uh, years and years and years for the body to to, um, to uh, deal with an environmental change and, and sort of evolve from that change. So it's fairly recent in the human body uh, space. And so in some ways, the body is learning how to deal with it. But by and large, it's still trying to figure out what to do with it. And that's a little bit of the challenges for us all. It's not really been around very long, and it's more intense now that we have it in our pockets. Right. And it's really close. And that's why it's more important to think about it, because we do know it does disrupt body function. Okay. It does heat up the cells in your body if it's close enough. So there's a lot of biological impacts that we're learning more and more about every every day and and, and it maybe in some uh, scientific research communities considered a, a, a more dangerous than maybe other uh, institutional uh, organizations think so it's a it's controversial space but nevertheless it's a growing interest and concern a hundred percent and and in terms of our cells, you mentioned how it cha- it can change. It can alter yeah. the cells oh, yeah. in our body, right? Yeah. And alter oh, our DNA. No. So let's talk about that. Yeah. When we when when we when we have a cell phone uh, to our head, the standards worldwide, by the way, are by and large only worried about how much the 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 the, um, the 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 material around the uh, the body material around that transmitter is responding from only a thermal point of view. In other words, when you have a cell phone to your head and it's for a six foot male, it goes in one or two foot, and when that does go in that one or two foot, it can heat up uh, several degrees the cells that are around that signal Mm -hmm. so that's a thermal impact that it's having but more disconcerting probably is the biological can you get cancer right can you get tumors can you get that but honestly uh uh, sandy those things are uh, they're growing concerns in the industry but what's even more, maybe more uh, of concern potentially is the neurological, the physiological. You get dizzy um, when you're close to these signals. You may even get depressed. You, you, your, your hands may hurt. They, they may sting. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of potential, very coarse, over a very long cross-sectional uh, issues that the body can react to. Many of us won't, but some of us definitely will. Yes, I've I've seen actual visuals on how holding a cell phone to your ear and length of time. So let's talk about that because I talk about toxic load in terms of, you know, overall health and wellness. And 
is it EMF? Is it about kind of like toxic load? Like the more that you get exposed to it, the more potential danger it can have to someone? I love the way you're describing it. It, it turns out um, it's a toxin in our environment, yeah. potentially. Yeah. Um, and, and with all toxins, the closer you get, the more it is, the maybe the worse it can be. And, um, and when you have chemicals in the air, some of us are considered multiply chemically sensitive. In other words, when you go next to someone who has perfume on, yes, you may not feel right. It, 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 it would upset you. For me, it won't, but for you, it can. It, it can be extreme where you can't even be close to someone who has a perfume on. And that's called the, the multiple chemical sensitivity. Well, there are equivalents to that in electromagnetic radiation space called uh, 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 electromagnetic hypersensitivity. So um, the environment having this new toxin is more problematic to the body than it was 50 years ago. Right. Yes, I look at it as pollution and how much can your yeah. body take. And we're all unique. I say that to yeah. every single client. No, no two people are alike. And what affects you in one way may affect me more drastically. Oh, no question about it. And by the way, women more than men, believe it or not, in the electromagnetic radiation space, believe it or not, wow. it's something like um, um, 80 Twenty percent of the population, worldwide population, is electric hypersensitive. I mean, in other words, when you have a cell phone close to you, it bothers you in some way. You may get headaches. Your eyes may hurt. There's a lot of a lot of symptoms for this, and and so um, that can um, impact twenty uh, percent uh, of us, and some very extremely. Yes. Of that twenty percent. 80% of women. Wow. And Sandy, I don't know why. Believe it or not, no one knows why. We keep on looking at hormones maybe being the source. We keep on looking at uh, the medications that women take different than men. There's a lot of potential reasons why. But I know for sure no one really knows why yet. Well, Dan, I'm so, just going to say it's because women are just so complex. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've never figured it out. <laughs> Um, let's, go, let's go back to another uh, another point you were making. Okay. Uh, and I'll give in the context of of um, the the brain and the head. Okay. When the standards were created for the U.S. market, um, they have a power level that they allow a cell phone to transmit, so it can heat up um, the surface of the head by one to two degrees Fahrenheit, I don't remember centigrade, okay. and, and about one to two inches, okay? Wow. So that was based on a six-foot male over 30 years ago, right. and that's when the U.S. standard was established, right? Sandy, it, it represents 3% of the marketplace. You know, what, what happened to 12-year-old kids walking around with phones when, they, when they're 12 years old? They, they all have cell phones in their pocket. What happened to the six-year-old called talking to the grandmother? So all of a sudden we have this very different mix of um, beyond the standards that doesn't um, reflect the, the use today versus 30 years ago. And what's the implication? Well, uh, I mentioned one to two degrees. If you're a six-year-old child, it goes all the way through your head. Wow, when you yes. Phone. You know, when you're a teenage... 12-year-old girl, it's halfway through their head. In other words, it is hitting the frontal lobe. It is hitting all the sensitive uh, parts of the body and some very important parts of the body. And we really don't have a lot of data saying just what the long-term impact of that is. Preliminary stuff suggests we may be entering into problematic areas in time. So that's the one thing I wanted to say. The other thing is you asked about DNA damage. Yes. When, 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 when you talk about, um, I mentioned ionized versus non-ionized, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. With ionized radiation, 
you actually knock the rotating electrons out of its orbit. Yes. It's charged, and that what mutates the cell. That's what creates damage to the DNA of of the cell, and that ultimately what creates the uh, tumors and then the cancers. Uh, so there's clear and well understood mechanics of breakdown of a cell yes. in the ionized world. In the non ionized world, it's a different way of breaking down, but ultimately, it breaks down the cell to a DNA damaged or mutated cell uh, space. And the way it does it is by literally hitting the cell membrane, tapping on it, tapping, 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 until it, it convinces the cell to uh, let that transmission through. And when it does, calcium, your own body calcium penetrates that cell. Uh, and that calcium creates a uh, chemical comp, uh, response. Um, and that evolves to those same conditions, mutated and damaged cells. So you, you talk, some of the researchers in the space talk about that breakdown, the calcium breakdown of a cell. But I'm not as worried about that as I really am. What is it doing to your 12 year old girl? Right. It's halfway through her head. We know there's a direct link between, um, through very small study work, that, uh, that there is impacts to the psyche of an individual and you're more susceptible because signals are going through as younger and younger you are. Right. And that kind of explains why children are much more vulnerable to yes. EMF. So... Yeah, that, so so here's, a, here's a, like a, a point uh, where, where I often don't like to talk about, but it's a fact. Okay. Now, we, we have the power of a, a cell phone in our hands. And when it's really, really close to you and you use it more than uh, 10 years uh, uh, with a lot of use, it, it be, you have three more time particles to get a, a tumor uh, in your frontal lobe. And so we know, as you were pointing out before, it's a cumulative and it's based on exposure. In this case, I explained an exposure, which over 10 years does create an increased probability of, of, of problems for the, for the frontal lobe. Um, so we know that um, these can be maybe more dangerous when you're using it more often over time, which is for us uh, something we should be aware of and have our kids certainly be aware of. Okay, well, that's a pretty eye-opening fa- uh, stat right there, just yeah. about... Well, think, think, think of this. Now, here's a cell phone. I just explained sort of how it does it. In a classroom, when you have a Wi-Fi transmitter in a room, you have all these um, laptops sitting there working with uh, these routers inside a, a classroom. It's about the third of the power level into the classroom or the cell phone. But it's on all day, eight hours a day. And so uh, I think you were implying before there's an increase in behavioral issues with kids. Yeah. Is there a direct link? Well, we think there may be. We have some evidence that says it. But these growing long-term exposures maybe are having these kind of um, uh, uh, impacts to our children. And you don't even really understand the sources. Wow. Well, that's, uh, that's actually, you know, I, I wanted to do this episode specifically not to scare people, but to, my big thing is education. Create awareness. Yeah. And then you're going to make yeah. your choice on what's right for you. So, you know, talking about, now Wi-Fi is different from having the cell phone in the pocket, but... I'll give you an example. In my house, we've always had a rule and we have a parking station where all devices must be parked (laughs) before bed. And obviously, I don't give that rule to my husband. (laughs) But this goes for my teenager kids. My son, who's now an adult, it doesn't apply to him because he doesn't live at home for most of the year anyway. But I still have one teen at home and she parks her phone and we have this argument quite probably about once a week about why she can't have her phone in her room. Does this make a difference with her having a bedroom free of 
a device that is constantly being pinged through the night? I, I got to tell you, um, that's one of my pet peeves. Your bedroom is a sanctuary. And um, you, if you can, need to be active in minimizing the toxins within that space. Yeah. Why it's a sanctuary at night is very, very important, and this is why. That's when your body recovers. That's when you have the, uh, uh, the cyclic nature of the human body recovery, and um, if it's being disrupted, then you're not sleeping right. Yeah. If you're not sleeping right, the mitochondrial is not necessarily... Um, recovering from the previous day. Um, you, you wake up and you're sleepy and tired, yet you just woke up after a full night's sleep and you're wondering why. Well, I, I was on a, a, a podcast once with, um, with a really, really bright lady. I really loved the girl, uh, the person. And, and, and I was telling her, you need to make a sanctuary because you have the circadian rhythm, which is so important to the body. You got to make sure that, um, that you um, be as respectful as you can. And I said, so do you have your cell phones near your phone, uh, uh, near your bed at night? And she said, oh, of course I do. Well, my husband has his and I have to, I said, please do not put a cell phone in your bedroom and um, it will disrupt your sleep. Yes. And she was very, very polite to me. And she said, oh yes, thank you so much, Dan. I really appreciate you giving me that coaching. She didn't believe a word I said. Really? She didn't, she didn't believe a word, right? And so about a month later, I got a phone call from her. And she said, my husband and I took our cell phones out of our bedroom. And guess what? We're sleeping all the night. And I said, well, there you go. Yeah. She, she didn't quite believe that that energy could be disruptive. And, of course, it's at the worst time when you're trying to recover uh, from your previous day. So mm -hmm. um, people don't realize even the littlest of intrusion of a toxin like that uh, can actually have a fairly serious impact to the way uh, your, your health is uh, being sustained uh, over time. Okay, well, that's good to know. Now, what about, uh, see, I have my phone in my room on... Yep. Um, I have it on airplane mode, so nothing is going to it. Nothing. It's almost like a dead phone. Does that make a difference? There, there, there's the uh, uh, GSM, uh, the, the uh, location stuff, and the, there are some applications that actually may be pushing your uh, your cell phone to ping. Uh, but by and large, you're pretty much okay. Okay. But as a cardinal rule, never keep close to your bed ever. Good to know. Never keep anything close to your bed. My clock, I have an AC clock, alternate current clock. I don't put it, but uh, I put it for at least four foot away. And I got really big letters on it now so I can see it, but it's <laughs> at least four foot away. And that's why, because there's emissions coming off of those, those technologies around us and you really want to minimize it. In fact, I actually go to the extent where I have a router in uh, in other parts of the house. Yeah, I turn that off at night. Okay, so you, I was going to ask you about that because yeah, yeah, does that it's make a difference? <laughs> that, that, those things are transmitting all night, and um, and just to be conservative, I get a ten dollar timer. I plug it into the wall, at 10 o'clock it goes off, and at 6 o'clock it goes on. So I'm never missing my, um, you know, the need to get on the uh, on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But um, I've reduced the toxins in the environment as much as I can for that sleep pattern I'm looking for. What about uh, those, you know, those router boxes, those cages? Do those do anything? Um they they impede the uh, the transmitters and so there is some benefit but in general i never like to describe uh, as so binary um what all the research we know of it's not that granular to know if a, a lower power signal the energy of one signal 
versus the higher energy of another is better than uh, one from the other. Okay. Uh, so in general, I say no. Right. And what because about... no science. Okay. When we, we actually switched providers a few years ago, I right. switched to Bell Canada, and yeah. they have all of these little... They're the... They call them expanders that you put throughout the house to expand the Wi-Fi because we always have issues with signals. And yeah. when he was putting one upstairs, this is the technician, I said, oh, my God, I don't think I want that up near the bedrooms. And he looked you at know. me like I was crazy. And he said, lady, can you see your next door neighbor's Wi-Fi signal on your phone? And I'm like, yeah, I can. And it's pretty strong. He goes, you can't get away from it. And that was his answer to me. <laughs> so. uh, the, 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 the transmitters from your neighbor, they are transmitting at six watts. And by the time it gets to you, it's, it's less than a third of a watt. Okay. You're never worried about the one that's distant. Okay. You're worried about the ones closest to you. That's because what I was power thinking. power levels are worse the closer yeah. it is. That's what I was you, thinking. Yeah, look, you can, you can take a cell phone and put it to your head, and that's probably the, the, the most potentially concerning space to the body. Mm -hmm. If I go uh, one to two foot away, 80% um, of the danger is gone. Right. By four foot, almost 98%. So the distance from these transmitters is sort of a big deal. Okay. So the guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, well, that's good. That clears things up for me. Um, but this is actually a perfect segue into talking about 5G. I have been dying to ask this question because I keep up on, I am personally, I read everything. I read actual proven studies, peer-reviewed studies. I read what's going on there. The one thing I don't believe quite often is just mainstream media. I do my own research, but I have to ask you because everyone's talking about 5G. Everyone's talking about these conspiracy theories, Dan, and how 5G is disrupting our cells, and that is what is creating this virus. So, Oh my gosh, talk to me about that. <laughs> okay, it's going to take me a little bit of time, but I'm going to try. Okay, um, okay. So uh, up to 4G of 1, 2, 3, 4 has been going on for 30 years. Yeah. And what they've been doing over those 30 years is improving the way in which they put information on to the wireless signal. They never really increased the frequency rates. The, the speeds of the signal towards towards the X-ray. Okay. Then they never did, but five G goes from what has been around with four G for a really long time, and then adds to it. So that's the starting point. Uh, I'm, I'm being sidetracked in my own mind. Okay. By the way, uh, 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 RF that from a cell phone up to four G, it suppresses your immune. So um, some of the arguments you're hearing is that may get worse, and and there is no evidence whatsoever of that. Okay. All. Yeah. But I'm telling you, your immune is um, uh, suppressed from our from a cell phone, laptop, radiation, um, uh, cell phone, router, whatever the these sources are. Um, and, and sort of as a side note, that's that's why your gut needs to be right. Your, your eating habits need to be right. Um, you need to be healthy to keep your immune up. Mm -hmm. So now I've talked about that. 5G introduces 2 gigahertz is roughly 1, giga, one to 2 gigahertz is roughly the speed of a, a signal. Think of it as a wave. Uh, watch the ocean, and you'll see waves in the in in the water. Yeah. And when you see one wave, and then you see the next wave over the same point, that's a frequency rate. Um, so 
when you're at the ocean or the or the Gulf of Mexico and you see one wave and it takes a, a, a second between one wave and the next, that's a, uh, in considered electronics, a hertz, one cycle per second. When you talk about RF signals today with cell phones, you talk about one billion of those cycles in one second. When you talk about the new 5G, you talk about 23 billion cycles per second. Wow. With the new 5G. And so um, it is very different. For most everything that's really happening, it's all around the 4G space. The frequency rates that they're using when it's quote unquote 5G space is all the stuff's been around for a long time. So what we know about the 4G stuff is relevant to the 5G. It's not changing our environment much more than currently. Okay. Um, but but this, so some people confuse um, the impact of um, uh, of an emission to your gut. By the way, um, we know that uh, up to 4G, your um, Ten times more bugs in your stomach uh, are, are are affected from 4G than cells in your body. So you really do want um, to make sure you have um, a balanced uh, immune as you can through your gut. Mm -hmm. um, but with this new 5G at 23 billion cycles per second, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't have experience. We don't have research or study work that talks about it. Um, so when you hear people having a theory about there may be direct links to disease, th that's sort of that correlation yeah. you know, to what we just spoke about. But you and I both know that it's the same stuff that's been around all along. So it really can't be um, uh, any... Um, any dangers more so than what's sort already of been around us. And there's no kind of correlation that's ever been identified up to the 4G. Now, with, with um, you and I were campus years ago, and, um, and, they, and they used to use water to, to break up these um, complaint kinds of things we had on campus, um, dispersing us because of the water. They have guns today that they point to you that are electromagnetic radiation and they use 90 gigahertz electromagnetic radiation 90 gigahertz which is in the 5g range okay that actually can touch your skin and and inside your skin you have these um uh, sweat glands they're like little coils well at 90 gigahertz loves little coils so it becomes an antenna and and now when they point these guns to us we run really fast because we are really really hot so what we know is in the 5g space there are transmitting sources that can be harmful can okay. be very harmful um but in general beyond 90 gigahertz we really don't know. Although I have seen research that talks about um, the bugs of your stomach, virus and bacteria, um, actually liking 20 gigahertz, they propagate more so than they do without. So we know there is potentially some implications again to our gut and our immune system, but certainly we at this point have no idea whatsoever what that would be. And 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 so like don't panic. Okay. Most of the stuff you're going to see over the next five years is what you've seen all along. Okay. Well, you know what? That actually really helps to debunk a lot of what's yes. going on. Because I will say I've had conversations with my husband at the dinner table about 5G. And, and for me, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I read right. and research and make my own make my own decisions on what I believe and what I don't believe. And so 
for me, it's more about questioning the safety. Right, right. Because, yeah. Here, yeah. yeah. Here's, here's, here's another point. Um, when we, remember I, I talked about radio signals, AM and FM? Yeah. A bit ago. Um, th- years and years ago, there used to be transmitters that transmitted at 1,000 watts, uh, 600 um, uh, 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 megahertz. Uh, and, and if you were within five miles of that signal, you would get leukemia. Oh my gosh. Uh, wow. three times more likely you get leukemia. Uh, and when you are talking about these new viruses, you wouldn't predict that because there's no evidence whatsoever in science that shows you that there's that link. If someone was saying, look, it, look at all the leukemia we see more now then you'd say maybe because the frequency rates they're using are much less than the high end 5G stuff we're talking about. Right. So um, it's we have correlated evidence that says there's no real additional exposures to us that we should be worried about. The, and I agree with you. It's the facts we should find out. Right. And so really it's just more powerful than the 4G. Right? No, actually. No, it's it's more than that. It's it's the frequency rate that was used up to four G is now ten times higher. Right. So it's really that much faster, and and that is where uh, we just don't know. Yeah. Well, honestly, we absolutely don't know because we've never seen this in our environment before, and we don't know how the body's going to react. We don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I predict it may be more of the same, but we don't really know. Okay, good. Good to know. That's actually somewhat positive, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> somewhat. Think. We'll see, right? We will see. <laughs> All right. Um, but, but, but the point is, don't panic about this stuff. It's okay. been around for a long time, and uh, most of us are okay. Some of us, I work with clinics that um, they deal with uh, people who are elective hypersensitive and there seems to be more of that these days than 10 years ago. Um, so we do know that there could be correlations based on some of the evidence we're looking at. Okay. But don't panic. Okay. You sound like my husband, Dan. (laughs) (laughs) I hope that's a good thing. (laughs) But that's actually what he was saying to me at the dinner table. So there you go. Um, Okay, so let me ask this question. We know a lot about the damaging effects. Yeah. We do know there's enough studies out there. Why aren't we being told how to protect ourselves from our government? Why aren't we being, you know, why is everything out there not really out there? People don't know a lot about the different things we can do to shield ourselves and protect ourselves? Well, that's a complicated question. So um, I didn't get a chance to mention I th- those 30 years you referred to in telecommunications. Yeah. I actually wrote standards for telecommunications technologies, and I would evaluate those technologies for compliance to those standards. That's what I did uh, for a living. For safety. And so... Yeah, and this is that's the point. When I when I worried about what the impact to a, something was, I would be concerned about the impact of one piece of electronics impacting a second electronics. They call it cross talk. I was worried about would there be problems with those other technologies around this that we really should be thinking about when we're testing these devices. We never wondered what would happen with a human uh, uh, exposed to these devices. It was only um, 15 years ago uh, that uh, I really began thinking that um, based on what I began seeing in research, that there was really some more clear evidence of that danger. And that has progressed over time. And the WHO, World Health Organization, they they define this as a category 2B carcinogenic now. Um, what does that mean? It, it's like arsenic. 
mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It, it can be dangerous. Yes. Uh, it's not likely to kill you, but it could. Um, and so it's taking us years to sort of understand it. In the U.S., um, um, their standard was, you know, based on six-foot males only thermal uh, over 30 years ago and hasn't changed yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, has research suggested there's problems? Absolutely no question whatsoever. Yeah. Independent research has shown clear evidence of correlation. Yeah. And, and so um, it's just typical with human. It, it, I smoked cigarettes 60 years ago because I wanted to be a big man. And at that time, uh, those cigarettes were known by research to cause cancer. But yet, all of us didn't know that. It took over 30 years for it to become public knowledge, common knowledge. And that's not unusual. When you introduce these kinds of technologies, it takes years and years to accumulate information and then uh, and take action as a result of that information, but that action t- oftentimes is many years down the road. So we're on our own, typically, with introductions of technology like this. And as you point out, it's pretty smart to, to try to figure out yourself yes. what it is. In, fa- in fact, I talk about it as you're the architect of your own destiny. Yes. You're the one who controls your environment. No one else does. And you shouldn't expect others to do it. Uh, so you really do need to make those choices yourself. That's a really, really good point there. I love that correlation because I talked to my kids about when I was in high school, nobody talked about the dangers of smoking and everybody smoked. And I remember smoking. We had the smoking pit, it was called. And right. we would, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we would and smoke was, between the doors. We didn't know, right? Nope, nope. And so I say to my kids, it would be pretty dumb for you to start smoking now, considering all that you know. So I love that. That's a great point. Now, after talking about all this, I have to ask how, because people are going to want to know, how can we protect ourselves? What can we do? So, um, time, uh, distance us, your friends, um, the less you're exposed, the better it is. Um, the distance from where the transmitters are to you, that's your friend. Mm -hmm. The closer it is, the worse, the farther away it is, the better. So time, when you use a cell phone, if you use a cell phone three minutes a day, and you do it every day, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. If you use a phone two hours a day, considered a heavy user, and you use it 10 years, you're three times more likely to have frontal lobe cancer. Mm. So you control that use. You can use it against your head if you don't want to, and you want some precautionary measures. You may put it in speaker mode. Um, you may want to use ear tips uh, to communicate. Um, And so there's so many different ways to take that transmitter away from your frontal lobe. And those are the actions you should be thinking about. Um, When you um, um, have a cell phone, you do exactly what I would recommend, by the way. You put your phone down in one spot and it, it is not in your living space. So you're minimizing that exposure by simply putting it in another room. Mm-hmm. So that distance is really a very positive uh, way of minimizing exposures. In general, I have a rule of thumb. I call it uh, bees in the room. One bee um, won't kill you a thousand will. Mm-hmm. Um, and so think about all the transmitters in your room. Uh, when you're in your living room and your kids have their tablets on working with the Wi-Fi, you have your cell phone in your pocket and so does your husband, you have uh, almost a dozen transmitters in that yeah. one room. Yeah. Um, do you need all those transmitters? Can you do it with wire connections? Uh, like I don't, I use every, Ethernet's my whole house. 
I don't I don't use uh, Wi-Fi. Really? Uh, and I, yeah, uh, mm. I've even had wired the whole house. So that's how I make connections. Now that doesn't mean I don't use the router and I don't keep it on open. I do when visitors come and stuff like that. But in general, I I tried not to use it. Uh, so uh, one B won't kill you a thousand will simply manage that environment you're in reduce the risk simply by when you have a cell phone on you have a transmitter for the cell connection you have a wi-fi connection potentially you have a bluetooth connection you are transmitting three transmitters out of one cell phone yeah do you need all three no i don't i i keep it to one and i reduce the number of transmitters by a third Wow. By simply turning them off. Okay, I like that. So, yeah, you just simply think about the sources and just just turn them off or move them away from it, and you're pr really pretty safe. Um, there are other ways of doing it as well, where you can actually uh, use shielding and other devices that yeah. are on the market to to help uh, minimize the exposures, and that's also um, a, a good way to go if if. If, if you're not going to throw your technology away and you want to use it close to you for whatever reason they are, there are some ways of actually providing protecting uh, by using shielding devices to do that. Okay, so... But in general, you do not have to have any of those devices if you manage those technologies around you. Well, uh, many of us have really busy families with teenagers who would probably um, kill you if you tried to change to an Ethernet. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. So... Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, have, I, I created uh, I, uh, uh, shielding materials for my, uh, for my sons. Yeah. Because they were using their laptop on their lap yes. for five hours at a time. Yes. And I know they weren't going to throw it away. So what I did was I created a shield for them where it doesn't allow the um, the signal to go in towards the groin. Okay. After three or four hours, the male sperm is immobile. Right, uh, right. Uh, 20, 25%, 20%, 25%. So I avoided that. Females get exposed uh, at that exposures. They end up uh, potentially with tumors. Actually, 2% will have a tumor. Yes. So there are some things you can do to minimize that because they're not going to throw that technologies away no and yeah and, and you're right no, you're never going to convince them to do it no no and same with my husband too so yeah, <laughs> he's also in that well, category don't, men don't listen <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so okay that's good to know so there are the shielding devices i have seen especially with these kids now they're doing school online yes. most of the time and I know here in high school in, in Toronto, uh, the kids are going two days a week just for three hours a day uh, to actual classes. The rest is done at home. So yeah. I have told my daughter many times, get that laptop off your body and right. don't right. have it on your body. But So the right. shielding devices do work. They do help. Yes. Uh, th there are the, some that do and others that may be questionable. So you, you really have to be diligent in, in making the choices okay. uh, on those technologies. Uh, you want independent uh, research that suggests that it's safe. Okay. Um, so that's what we look for, Dan. We look for independent research to say that right. it's safe and that it works. Right, exactly. It's, it's, it, the claims are uh, made by independent uh, sources. I don't want to forget this. With with the kids around looking at monitors more so than ever before, yeah, there is a, and I'm sure you know about this, Sandy, the blue blue component of that, yeah, uh, of the, the blue light that's coming off of those LEDs. Mm -hmm. Those can be dangerous. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts about that. Okay. Um, ultraviolet light is. Um, where non-ionized radiation converts to ionized radiation, x-rays. Um, it, it's really, really intense. And as you know, ultraviolet light is, can cause cancers to your skin. That's because of its intensity. 
Wow. And, and so right next to that is blue light, believe it or not. Literally, it's right on the edge. And so when you have these monitors that you're looking at for hours at a time, you're, you, there are a rainbow of colors, including blue. That blue is very intense. You look at that blue all the time, it can have impact. Uh, I had a, uh, I work with uh, several clinics and I was talking with one uh, physician uh, uh, and, and, and he was telling me about someone in his office who had dry eye. And I said, what does she do in the office? And so she's always on the screen and she's doing all this work for us. And I said, why do you, why, why does she have dry eye? And he says, well, oh, I don't know, but you know, the last five, 10 years we've been giving her drops and it seems to work. And I said, hold on. And I sent him a set of uh, blue, block, blue block glasses. Mm -hmm. And within two hours, the dryness disappeared. Wow. It's a known condition that blue light can create dry eye premature macular degeneration. There's a whole host of concerns you have with that blue light component. And these days, when all these kids are looking at monitors, they really benefit from uh, shielding that, that, that blue component of the uh, uh, color spectrum. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up, Dan, because I actually bought both my kids blue light blocking glasses and even wow. my husband has has gotten into it, which is great. And then yep. I, I recently updated my prescription reading glasses, and I got the blue yep. light put into my prescription lenses. So yep. I'm so glad you brought it up and talked about it because it's so important. Yeah, it, it is very much. And that's one of those things. It was introduced in the technologies, and we didn't even realize it. Um, and so, but more and more we are, and, and more and more it's important to watch it because it does, it goes far beyond when, when you're, when you're in bed at night and you're looking at your tablet and there's blue light coming out of that tablet, do you know that that blue light is entering into your eye and there's a cryptochrome protein within the back of the eye that is the switch that turns on the uh the uh melatonin or not wow. so when you're looking at it it looks like to the um uh cryptochrome that it's still light out so the switch to put the melatonin on has not been activated so you put your tablet down and you can't go to sleep and you're yeah. wondering why it's oh. because the body hasn't naturally began the melatonin cycle. Yes. Yeah. So that's even more important to, if you choose to read, that you try to get that blue light component out of that signal because it will affect the, your sleeping pattern, the sick nature of, a, of, a, of, of sleep. Yes. Well, parents, that's really, really valuable and powerful information. So keep that in mind just to, to educate yourself on this. I love this, Dan. Yeah. So I guess it's time we can wrap this up. So Dan, can you tell okay. us where can listeners go to get more information about EMF radiation and 5G? Um, I have a website um, and it's defendershield.com and um, we sell products, which I'm not here to talk about, but we have a section, a learning section, um, that actually breaks down all the research and study work up to 4G as well as 5G, where you can actually find information, facts about, um, these technologies that, uh, has been concentrated for you for that purpose. Uh, 5G, we have actually five or six pages of, of just descriptions. What is it and what is it not? So people can understand the facts. Uh, so I would encourage people to um, to do uh, a little bit of research through there. Hello. The other thing is on the website is I we wrote the book. My son and I wrote a, a book about this because we were so frustrated that there was so much information we knew in research 
but no one knew about it, including me. Mm. And I was in the industry. And so uh, I would strongly recommend them that you consider a radiation nation. It describes wh what it is, um, what we know about it in some of the research, and what are the things you can do in terms of keeping yourself protected and safe for you and your family. Amazing. So uh, I, I recommend those sources. Amazing. Thank you so much, Dan. And I will be sure to have that information linked in my show notes. And oh, thank you. Thank you for coming today and providing us with such a powerful podcasting information session. This was so really informative, Dan. I thank you for taking the time. Well, Sandy, thanks so much for inviting me. I, I really do appreciate you taking the time talking about these things for, for your listening audience because it's sort of important, particularly for the moms. Oh, yes. Um, having your kid grow up you need to sort of know where all the toxins are. Absolutely. electromagnetic radiation. Yes. Thank you so much, Dan. Okay, Sandy. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Join me next week where I cover off more exciting topics. I hope to continue to engage you and excite you and show you that living in your 40s, 50s, and beyond can be exciting, balanced, and helpful. Bye for now.